Franklin Pierce University student Cece Telfer won the women's 400 meter hurdles last Saturday evening. Telfer is the first student athlete in the university's history to collect an individual national title. Telfer, however, previously ran a variety of events for the university's men's team. Cece, formerly known as Craig, is a male running female races. So here's yet another situation where a male athlete who is now identified as transgender has won a female athletic competition. Can you imagine if as a pastor I showed up at North Kansas City Hospital and I said that I identified as a brain surgeon? The logic is the same. There have been times that I've awakened in the morning and I said, man, I feel like I'm 18 years old again. And then I look in the mirror, and I'm not. Would a restaurant let me eat for free if I identified as a child on the Tuesday night kids eat free? Would that happen? The reason that I'm bringing up these ridiculous notions is to remind us to remind us as believers that the world in which we live is not the world from which we should glean our morals and our thinking. As someone said, we live in a society where homosexuals lecture us on morals, transvestites lecture us on human biology, and abortion providers lecture us on human rights. It's a messed up world. It's a messed up world. But we still have to do whatever we can do for whatever parts of our world that we can. So there are some things that we need to properly understand. Put on your thinking caps for this one, okay, as we set the stage for the subject for today. Two apples up in a tree were looking down on the world. The first apple said, look at all of these people fighting and robbing and rioting. No one seems willing to get along with his fellow man. Someday we apples will be the only ones left, and then we'll rule the world. To which the second apple replied, which one of us, the reds or the greens? The reds and the greens both matter. Men and women both matter. Let me set the, set the record straight. I'm not here this morning to debate anything. I'm certainly not going to debate whether sexism is right or wrong. It is most certainly wrong. The challenge, however, is that even whenever we talk about racism, as we did last week, or when we talk about sexism, as we're doing this week, even having an opinion about something related to race is now oftentimes considered racist, or having an opinion about something related to gender is now oftentimes labeled sexist. If I say this, and this is just a general statement, if I say, I think women are more detail-oriented than men, someone will say that I'm speaking negatively of men. I'm not. I'm a man, and my experience has taught me that statement is generally true. Of course, there are, ex there are exceptions. Men who are engineers or perhaps architects are extremely detail-oriented. If I say, and this is a general statement, I think that men are typically physically stronger than women, someone will say I'm speaking negatively of women. I'm not. It's just that my experience has taught me that statement is generally true. Of course, there are exceptions. Women who are bodybuilders are likely stronger than a lot of men. I have no problem dealing with this subject at all. I do, however, find it a bit ironic that it worked out to preach on sexism on my wife's birthday. <laughs> but for the record, she told me I could. So this morning we continue our series, Elephants in the Room, The Sin of Sexism. Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 29, page 974 in the Bibles there in front of you. And I'll invite you to stand, please, as we read the word together. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. 
But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Thank you so much. You may be seated. The sin of sexism. We're using this text once again as background for this morning, but we'll also utilize other pertinent biblical passages. Since the first of the year, our preaching time has been spent talking about things that nobody really wants to talk about, but somebody needs to talk about. So we've talked about the authority of the Bible and the sanctity of life. We've talked about marriage and singleness. We've talked about so-called gay marriage. We've talked about gambling and depression and divorce and remarriage, cohabitation, as well as suicide. We talked about the resurrection and heaven and hell. And then we've talked for the last few weeks about homosexuality and racism. So remaining on the list of subjects are the following, burial versus cremation, social media and how we speak, politics, capital punishment, gluttony, pornography, immigration, dating, money and giving, alcohol, marijuana, gender bending, which we'll deal with just a bit today, creation and evolution, and the discipline of the Lord, as well as the discipline of the local church. Now, some of these will stand alone. Some of them we will combine. And I probably will talk one day about what eternal security means and what it doesn't. In other words, what do you think about the person who says he's a believer, but lives out all of his days essentially as a pagan? It begs the question, is he really saved? So to the task at hand this morning, what is sexism? By definition, sexism is prejudice, stereotyping, or discrimination typically against women on the basis of sex. Essentially, the points that we utilized last week talking about racism are essentially what we could say about sexism. Sexism exists. Sexism should not exist among kingdom people. Sexism can be nullified by the grace of God, and there will be no sexism in heaven. We could go home now. But since the royals don't play the rangers till 2.05, you might as well hang around. So let's talk about these things, and in the process, talk a bit about gender bending as well, as the various roles that men and women have within society, and then more importantly, within the church. So let's dig in. Number one, there is no place for sexism among believers. There's no place for sexism among believers. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. We're all image bearers of God. The point is, we're always supposed to treat one another with the utmost respect. Even as we talk about sexism, I want to be clear. We cannot dissolve the differences between genders, and the reality is we shouldn't even attempt to dissolve these differences. I went to school a lot of years to learn what I'm about to tell you. This is really profound. No one can be a woman better than a woman. And that's true for men as well. No one can be a man better than a man. And the reason that I can say that, and the reason that's the reality is this, because that's how God created us. God created male and God created female. We believe, in fact, that gender is a gift from God. So if you're a man, God designed it that way. If you're a woman, God designed it that way. That's one of his many gifts to you. All the way back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, remember what the Bible says. Both of these are are image bearers of God. God created male, God created female. Both are image bearers of God. We are created just as God wanted us to be created. Within the church then, just like within the home, just like within creation, men and women are of equal value. 
but we also at times have different functions. And recognizing our differences, and certainly our different functions, hear me clearly, is in no way sexist. In some ways, we need to say some things about the culture, and yet in most ways, we can't do anything about the culture at large unless or until the culture buys into what we buy into, and people are not going to do that until they become followers of Jesus. Here's what I mean. There are some basic manners that should be taught to men and women, and these are things in our culture and even within the church that we would say that wouldn't rise to the level of being biblical necessarily. Although, in some cases, I think that you can connect the dots to make it go back to somewhat of a biblical foundation. For example, when a woman comes to the table, if I'm at a restaurant and a lady has excused herself and she comes back to the table, I stand. That's just what I was taught. That's manners. Back in the old days, you guys remember when pastors would sit up on the platform? Remember that? And you guys would watch us to make sure that we got the words to the hymns right? You guys remember that? When a woman would walk up on the platform and we would, we would have been seated, then we would stand. There's not a chapter and verse that says to do that. But that was and is at some level a way to honor women. And I would say, connecting it back to Paul's words in Romans 12, that's a way to outdo one another in showing honor. It was just a simple, kind gesture. It's the same thing for opening doors. Now, I know when I talk about opening doors, I'm going to also open a can of worms. The Bible doesn't say that when you get to the door that a man should open the door for a woman. But in our culture, at least up until recent past, generally our culture has even noted that's a sign of respect. So I trust you men do that. But here's the part of the problem in the culture, and then I'm going to get back to the church. In our culture today, we're sending a mixed signal about gender and sexuality. Isn't that true? Like, isn't that true? Parents are scared to death to teach their little girl it's okay to be feminine. And parents are scared to death to teach their little boys that it's okay to be masculine. We're sending mixed signals in our culture. The fact of the matter is we're messed up. Sometimes, when we back to the door thing, sometimes a woman will feel as if that gesture of opening the door or standing might be demeaning to her autonomy. And she might think or say, I'll get it myself. I went to seminary with a young lady named Andrea. She was an associate pastor at a Baptist church in St. Louis. And I remember one day when we were in seminary and we got to the door and I reached out and grabbed the handle to pull the door open and she said, don't you dare. To which I responded, don't I dare not, and if you knew my daddy, you'd understand why I have to open this door. I wasn't being demeaning to her at all, but some will feel as if that's demeaning to her autonomy. She doesn't want a man to open the door, or perhaps doesn't want a man to pick up the tab at a restaurant. Well, fast forward just a bit. She's dating someone. She likes the guy. They date, and he's never picked up the tab. They marry, and then she's surprised when he still doesn't do these things, and yet the pattern was already set. I would hate to be a kid growing up now. I really would. I, th I think this is tough. People are amped up about all kinds of things related to the sexes in this day and age as perhaps like never before. If you open a door for a female, some look at you as if you're being condescending. No, it's called being nice. In fact, for the most part, I open doors for everybody. I, th I think it's just called respect. Even whenever I was 16 years old and I would uh, go someplace with a girl, maybe go to the movies or stop by McDonald's, I paid. Now the Bible, listen, the Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't say anything about that. It's a cultural thing. But I think it's indicative of patterns that will develop. Certainly the Bible does say, if you fast forward, it does talk about how a man is supposed to take care of the needs of his family. He is financially responsible for his family. And I know that while you're dating that you're not yet family, but patterns, patterns are hard to change. So it's quite likely during the first year of your relationship, if your date never picks up the tab for McDonald's, he might not pick up the tab for the mortgage either once you say, I do. 
But I know some of this seems a bit more like a soapbox than a sermon, so let me rein myself in. But I want you to know I feel a whole lot better about me. As Christians, we're supposed to treat one another with respect. And most certainly, we Christian men are to treat women with respect, utmost respect, in all purity, Paul reminds us. So we men are to look at the opposite sex without impure thoughts in our mind or impure words on our tongue. They're our sisters. Paul reminds us in other places, Ephesians 4 and also 5 to be exact, about how we are to behave. Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Ephesians 5, 4, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. If someone says, I'm not sure if I should say this or not, here's a, here's a hint. They probably shouldn't. So there's no place, listen to me, there's no place for a Christian to ever objectify another person to speak rudely or crudely in a way that does not build up, edify that other person. Simply put, here it is, treat one another with respect in all purity. So there's no place for sexism among believers. Secondly, not only is there no place for sexism among believers, but there is a place for differences among believers. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Now I recognize that 50 years ago, perhaps, it wouldn't have been necessary for a pastor to say this, but I'm going to say it now. We really believe this. We believe this actually happened. Now, when it comes to gender, it's important to recognize that while there is no place for sexism, there is a place for differences. The problem at some level, however, is that there are people who will say even recognizing the differences would be viewed as sexist. With all due respect, I don't believe that's the case. There is order in creation, and I believe, and I'm not alone in this, by the way, I believe that the order of creation is meant to be reflected in the culture, meant to be reflected in the home, and meant to be reflected in the church as well. There are two terms that we've noted previously that I have to mention here, complementarianism and egalitarianism. This will be great if you ever play Trivial Pursuit. Complementarianism and egalitarianism. Complementarianism essentially states that though there may be gifts that both men and women possess, there are biblically designated roles for each of the sexes. For example, both men and women can balance the checkbook. Men and women can serve as ushers in worship. Men and women can help the kids with homework and work on the church landscaping. Shameless plug for the church landscaping crew. Did you get that? But complementarians would say, a woman is not to serve as an elder. Pastor and elder are interchangeable terms designating the same office. So complementarians would say that a woman is not to serve as a pastor because they believe the scripture prohibits her from doing so. Egalitarians teach that men and women are both fully qualified in every area of service within the church, including being a pastor. Our denomination, our church included, believes the complementarian concept properly understood to be right. Our SBC churches believe that the office of pastor is reserved for men. But let me be clear, not because we think men are better, but rather because of the way we interpret the scriptures. 
Neither of these positions, by the way, draw their conclusions from thin air. Both would say they're biblical. The complementarians would simply say they're following Scripture at essentially face value, sort of as it is. And the egalitarians would say that all of the Scriptures dealing with male leadership are culturally conditioned and are not universal requirements. So, if you take that to the extreme, then the egalitarians would say the man doesn't have to be the head of his own home. It's important, I think, to remember man was created first in the Old Testament, skip ahead to the New Testament, and man possesses what the New Testament calls headship over his wife, and that certainly seems to be universal in scope. But don't let what the culture says about that make you define what that actually means. As Dr. Owen Strand notes in a recent Pathios article, and I quote, Adam is constituted as the leader of his home. He is given authority in it, authority that is shaped in a Christ-like way as the biblical story unfolds. According to the Apostle Paul, a godly husband does not lord his role over his wife, but rather sees his headship in cruciform terms. He dies to himself over and over in order to love his wife and children well. Men are called to provide spiritual leadership and protection of the church. Elders preach, teach, and shepherd the flock of God. Only men are called to the office of elder, and only men who excel as heads of their wives and children are to be considered possible candidates for eldership. Look with me at Paul's words in 1 Timothy 2, 12 through 14. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. In some ways, I will tell you, I think this is the clinch pin to the complementarian argument. People say, for example, of Paul's words, well, what is cultural and what is universal? I believe that the issue written about in 1 Timothy 2 is universal from the perspective that Paul takes us back to the beginning of humanity. It's the foundation for relationships in our culture, in the home, and most certainly within the church. But it's important to recognize this, that the subordinate role of the wife is not a result of the fall. That's not why it's this way. In fact, God established these roles this way from the beginning. God made the woman to be a suitable helper for the man. And I know that rattles a lot of people. People say, do you mean to tell me that God made the woman to be a helper for the man? Well, that's exactly what the Bible says. And I know a lot of people don't like that, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do with that what I do with a lot of other things. In fact, I'm going to have it etched on my tombstone. It is what it is. This is not about keeping anybody down. It is most certainly not about keeping women down in the workplace. No one should ever say that a woman should not make as much money as a man doing the same job in the workplace. This is not about men being superior in any way, and certainly not about men taking advantage as their leadership or as leaders in their home. The picture here is that of Paul forbidding a woman from exercising authority over men in the church assembly. The elders, according to 1 Timothy 5.17, are those who are supposed to rule the church. And 1 Timothy 3 indicates that the elders or pastors are to be men. There's nothing, nothing I can do about that, even if it would be easier to look at that differently. Now let me pause for a moment so we can let the air back in the room. The reason I believe what I believe and the reason the church functions as it does is not because we're in any way seeking to squelch the leadership of the women in our midst. Obviously, different circumstances. But I'll say the same thing that I have said about uh, a lot of other supposedly controversial issues, whether we're talking about gay marriage or cohabitation or abortion, other hot-button issues. I don't have the luxury of changing the text. It is what it is. Like it or not, men played and are to play a crucial role in the church. Jesus chose 12 men to be his disciples. The early church pastors were all, without exception, men. The scriptures were written by men. Some may debate that point. 
I'm not saying all of that to say men are better, but for whatever reason, this is what God has done. And we've said that gender is a gift from God. And so we have to figure out how to do what we're supposed to do with the way God made us. It's not that one is better and one is worse. It's just that we're different. I promise you that the ladies who have been volunteers here in our church and certainly the ladies on our staff will tell you they've had a seat at the table. I would never, hear me clearly, I would never want to denigrate the importance of a woman's role within the church. But having said that, and this is what brands us sexist in some ways, the position of elder, which carries with it responsibility for teaching the whole church, is reserved for male leadership. And this is not the case because men are better, but for whatever reason, this is sort of God's proverbial flow chart. Now I recognize, and let me be clear here, I recognize that there are single mom and single dad homes. And I wanna say God bless all of you for doing literally the work of both parents. I can't imagine. So this is not an indictment against that at all. But in a home with a husband and a wife, present? This is a question. Who is supposed to be the spiritual leader in the home? The man or the woman? Okay, so we're agreed on that. The husband. And I'm sure that we have all seen the result far too often of homes where men have abdicated that leadership responsibility. If that's the case in the physical family, doesn't it stand to reason that's the case in the spiritual family, i.e. the church as well? One of the many problems that we have with all of this today is how lightly the role of manhood and womanhood is taken by some. We don't value one another, and we don't value the differences. I told you before, I learned a long, long time ago, there are things that I need to ask my wife about before I make some decisions. In fact, we always make sure when we're in the process of calling staff members that she's along for lunch or for dinner, etc. I could have saved myself untold grief if I had listened to her. The problem is we are literally toying with created order. In fact, much of the positive concepts about the family and much of the positive concepts about sexuality, as I'm sure you've noticed, they're vanishing from our society. And nobody really knows or at least wants to act as if they know how they're supposed to act as a man or how they're supposed to act as a woman. And in the words of the great theologian, Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? Our kids are all messed up. You guys know this, right? Our kids are all messed up, and they're being told it doesn't matter what equipment you have, you can function as something else. And that's just like me going to North Kansas City Hospital and saying, today I self-identify as a brain surgeon. Where's the operating room? Abraham Cooper, in the Stone Lectures at Princeton, once said, Modernism, which denies and abolishes every difference, cannot rest until it has made woman man and man woman, and putting every distinction on a common level kills life by placing it under the ban of uniformity. He said that over a hundred years ago. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what he would think and what he would say if he saw our contemporary culture? The point is that however God has established the family, the church, and the culture as a whole, it is most certainly for the holiness of his people. So again, while I know that people today think they have a better way than the biblical way, I would simply say with all due respect, I disagree. In a Gospel Coalition article from 2012, Mary Cassian, a female, writes, Complementarians believe that God created male and female as complementary expressions of the image of God. Male and female are counterparts in reflecting His glory. Having two sexes expands the view. Though both sexes bear God's image fully on their own, each does so in a unique and distinct way. Male and female in relationship reflects truths about Jesus that are not reflected by male alone or female alone. Complementarians stand against the oppression of women. We want to see women flourish, and we believe they do so when men and women together live according to God's Word. I couldn't agree more. There's no place 
for sexism among believers. Nobody's better, nobody's worse. And there's no, there is a place for differences among believers. And finally, and please, please get this, there is no place for denigrating anyone at any point. In Romans 12, 10, the Apostle Paul says, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Would you say that with me? Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. You guys remember Rodney King? Remember the name? The Los Angeles riots and all that took place then. Rodney King famously asked a question. He said, can we all get along? Can we all get along? Well, the truth is, we can't. And the reason we can't is because people with differences won't allow themselves to be friends with or be nice to or sometimes even tolerate those with a different mindset. Listen, I recognize there are varying opinions about most everything I say, certainly about the subject matter for today. But I want you to know that regardless of whatever differences exist among believers, as followers of Christ, we're supposed to treat one another with proper respect. I'm going to give you a little personal insight here that may prove helpful to you. I determined a long time ago not to get rattled with people when they disagree with me, even when they're ugly about it. Someday I'm going to write a book about all the ugly and stupid things people have said to me through the years as a pastor. It's going to be filed in fiction because nobody would believe it really happened. I tell our staff all the time, you can, as a pastor, you, you, can, you can lose your cool, you can have a temper tantrum, one time, because then you're done. Like, you guys, you guys can, you know, drive down the highway and give people hand signals. We can't. <laughs> so I determined a long time ago I was not going to get rattled with people when they disagree with me, even when they're ugly about it, and here's why. I can win the battle. I can be right and lose the war. If my deportment and response to others who differ with me is less than Christ-like, then I lose credibility, even if what I'm saying is proper. And I don't want to do that. In fact, I'll tell you, I am as committed to the concept of honoring others as I am to the doctrinal positions I hold that might be the very point of conflict between people. If you've ever followed my social media presence, you know this to be the case. I've had people say all kinds of things about me, about our church, about our faith, and so forth. But I'm not going to let them get me rattled. I'll, it, it may be a pride thing, which I need to repent of later on, I don't know. But I'm not going to give anybody that kind of control over my disposition, especially when it comes to our faith. Because you'll leave here, and you may be having coffee with somebody, and they're going to say, I heard your pastor said women shouldn't be pastors. And they're going to try to, you know, put a ding against our church, etc. Listen to me. There is great comfort in knowing where you stand and with whom you stand. So somebody disagrees. Okay. Anybody married? So they disagree, and they're ugly about it. Okay. So they think that you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny. Okay. And when people get that way with me, here's what I think. I have a beautiful wife. I have a decent home. I drive a vehicle that I like. And all three of my grandkids are better than yours. <laughs> one guy in the second service I thought was going to come up and fight me after that one, man. I pastor an absolutely wonderful and growing church and tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to an office where people generally like me. That wasn't funny. <laughs> where I'm surrounded by my books and I'm going to sit in a really comfortable chair. I can drink all the coffee that I want and I study. And then I get to stand up next Sunday morning, open the Bible and teach it to people who are part of my family serving the God we love. And then one day, when the sun sets on my life and my voice grows silent, I get to live somewhere forever that is more beautiful than Augusta National Golf Club during Master's Week. 
So where's the downside to all this? So somebody disagrees. So they're ugly about it. Okay. I'm not going to change what I believe. Listen, what I believe got me here. So I'm not going to let people get me rattled because of what I believe. And the last time I checked, God knows more than the rest of the people anyway. 